we're going to go over some of the changes to our stroke protocol. Uh, there's been some new science that came out that showed the superiority of comprehensive stroke centers over primary stroke centers for large vessel obstruction strokes, which are some of the more devastating strokes. So you're going to see some changes in terms of our destination criteria so that we can get patients to the right location uh, right up front, right immediately. In addition, uh, and you'll see I'm going to do as a separate part of this video, we're going to be expanding our screen for strokes to do a little bit more than just the Cincinnati stroke scale. The Cincinnati stroke scale does cover a lot of the strokes, and that's what we're all, we're all pretty familiar using. But there's, that only covers certain parts of the brain, and it's still about 15% of the strokes where the Cincinnati stroke scale can't pick up. So you're going to see that we're going to expand our screen. Um, what we do is more similar to the Miami Emergency Neurological Deficit Screen, or the MEN screen. Uh, and you'll, you'll see I'll do that exam while in, in a moment here, and I'll be part of this video clip. So a couple of the first things to, that I want to talk about in the, uh, the stroke protocol. So you'll see we have an information box talking about Bell's palsy. The reason I put it that, that in there is because Bell's palsy is one of the mimickers of stroke. And it's something that it's relatively common, tends to affect younger folks, although it can be anybody, any age, but a lot of times younger folks get this, and people are worried that they have a stroke, and they look like they're having a stroke, but it's not a stroke. And the way to tell the difference is, uh, with Bell's palsy, you get isolated facial weakness. There's no other symptoms at all. There's no visual symptoms, there's no speech symptoms, there's no motor weakness in the extremities, et cetera. It's isolated only to the face. And the symptoms tend to be gradual, meaning they start noticing that they have some minor symptoms, and then over the course of hours or even a day or two, the, uh, the facial droop gets worse. And the big difference and the clue for us, and the one simple thing we can do on exam, it has to involve the upper part of the face. See, in Bell's palsy, the facial nerve is affected. And the facial nerve covers the entire face, the, the top of the face and the lower part of the face. Whereas in a stroke, the forehead and the, the muscles around the eye are one of the few areas in the body where both sides of the brain control both sides of the body. In general, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. But when it comes to the face, the left side of the brain controls the upper right side of the face and the right side of the brain controls the upper right side of the face. So that's how you can tell the difference between a stroke, because if it's Bell's palsy, it'll wipe out the ability to move your eyebrows and your eyelids. Whereas in, Bell's, uh, whereas in a stroke, that will be preserved. You'll still be able to do that. So what you do is you basically ask the patient to raise their eyebrows up. And if one eyebrow raises and one doesn't, that's Bell's palsy, because in a stroke, you can still raise both eyebrows. Another thing you can do is have them squeeze their eyes really tight. And what you'll notice that one eye squeezes really tight like there's soap in it, and the other doesn't squeeze as tight. Again, that is Bell's palsy, because Bell's palsy will make it weak. A stroke, you don't get weak, you don't get weak in that area. So if the eyebrow exam and the uh, eyelid squeezing exam is normal, that's a bad sign. That means it's probably a stroke. If it's weak, it means it's probably Bell's palsy. That's how you can tell the difference. Obviously, if, if you're in doubt, call it a stroke alert. But if it's isolated to the face and it does involve the, the, uh, the forehead and the eyebrows, you're probably just dealing with Bell's palsy, especially if it's a younger, younger patient. All right, so as far as our transport destination, in 2013, the American Stroke Association basically came out with some guidelines to address areas such as ours where there's a combination of both primary and comprehensive stroke centers. Now, obviously, what I'm about to say does not really go for our Western communities where Lakeside is the only game in town. But for the Eastern Corridor, where we've got a, a choice between primary and comprehensive stroke centers, what the American Stroke Association said was, we should really be taking patients to the highest level of care within a 20 minutes radius. So if you're in a location, your patient, you're picked up your patient, and you can get to both a primary and a comprehensive within that 20 minute window, the American Stroke Association is suggesting we go to the highest level of care, which in this case would be comprehensive. In addition, if we're going to take somebody to a primary stroke center, they have to be somebody that a primary stroke center can treat. And the primary stroke center can only provide TPA. Now, while TPA is useful for strokes, we already know that large vessel strokes do better at comprehensives. That's why if we have a choice between primary and comprehensive, we're going to go to comprehensive. However, if it's within a 20-minute window, all you can go to is a primary because you're coming from out west, and the comprehensives are too far away to make it within that 20 minute time frame, then primary stroke center is going to be your destination, provided that the primary stroke center can treat the patient. This means that the, stroke, uh, the onset of the stroke symptoms are known. It's not somebody that just woke up with a stroke. It's not somebody that was found and we don't know when the stroke symptoms started. 
So we have to know that the stroke symptoms started and that they started within two hours. And that's because there's a time limit to give TPA. If we're outside that time limit, you can no longer give TPA, in which case your only option for treatment is going to be interventional therapy at the Comprehensive Stroke Center. So number one is we have to know the time of onset, and that time of onset has to be within two hours. Number two is there can't be any contraindications to TPA, such as the patient is taking Coumadin or Xarelto or some of these other powerful blood thinners. The patient can't have had recent surgery in the last couple of weeks. They can't have had any significant head trauma. So basically, anybody that you'd be afraid to give a very powerful blood thinner to because they've got signs of bleeding or signs of trauma or recent stroke, they are not a candidate for primary stroke center. So even if you are further away from a comprehensive than 20 minutes, if, they are, if you find that you have a, have a patient where uh, they're not a good candidate for primary stroke, either because they're outside of the time window or if they've got one of these contraindications that are listed in the protocol, then we're going to drive even further and we're going to go to comprehensive. Now, that's not to mean that we're going to drive all the way from Belglade out there. There is, there is a time frame window. We want to try to keep our transport times to a reasonable time frame, 25, 30 minutes or less. If it's going to be more than that, then we have to start thinking about, uh, for the Western communities, taking these patients to Lakeside, having them work in, in concert with one of the comprehensive stroke centers, perhaps start TPA under the direction or telemedicine with St. Mary's or one of the other comprehensives, and then either taking them by ground or by air to one of the comprehensives. So for Lakeside, uh, we will have a little bit different protocol, but for everybody that's working in the Eastern Corridors, highest level of care within 20 minutes. If you can go, you can go to the primary stroke center, if they're the only place you can get to within 20 minutes, provided there's no contraindication to TPA. A couple of things that you, uh, if you attend Dr. Malik's lecture, who's one of the interventional uh, uh, neuro guys in this county, you'll hear him say these things that we've also uh, encompassed in our protocol. For the stroke patients, we want to lay them flat. It has to do with the blood supply to the ischemic area in the brain. What we find is when you lay people flat, you get a little better uh, circulation to the ischemic areas of the brain. In addition, we want to get, give these people a 500 cc bolus of fluid. That's for a couple of reasons. Number one is you want to uh, expand the vascular space. You want to dilute out the uh, things that cause blood clots. And also, uh, these patients are going to be getting contrast uh, at the hospitals as part of their imaging, and the contrast is better tolerated by the kidneys if they're very well hydrated. So we want to give them all, all 500 cc boluses. The other thing that Dr. Malik has asked us to do, which uh, I'm fine with, is uh, start them all on two liters of nasal cannula oxygen. So just low flow oxygen, unless there's some reason because of respiratory uh, distress where you have to do more than that, we want to stick to just two liters of nasal cannula, not high flow oxygen. All right, we're going to go over our expanded neurological exam here. Uh, obviously, we all know the Cincinnati Stroke Scale. I'm going to start with that. And this is designed so we can pick up some of the strokes that the Cincinnati Stroke Scale itself doesn't, doesn't get. So we'll first start with our, with our patient here on the stretcher. is usually the easiest way to examine them. And you start with the, the basic Cincinnati Stroke Scale stuff. So let's have you put your arms straight out like this. And let's put your palms up, palms up to the sky, like that. Oh, okay. There we go. Right. And then what you want to do is have the patient close his eyes. And what we're looking for here, and the reason why you want palms up, is because you're looking to see if one tilts in, because that would be a sign of a subtle stroke. If they both tilt in, that's negative. So for all these things in stroke, you can relax for a second. All these things for a stroke, we're looking for difference between one side and the other. So if they both tilt in, that's nothing. If they both don't lift up well, that's nothing. If one doesn't lift up right, that's obviously positive. So if they're so weak that they can't even lift it off the bed, there's obviously a difference one side to the other. So uh, if they can lift them both up, but one starts to turn in, then that's a problem. That means that there's a difference in the, in the strength between the two, and that is a positive for a stroke. So back to the arms up position here with the palms up. And you have your eyes closed. The next step that Cincinnati Stroke Scale does not check for us, and since you're already in this proper position, this would be the next thing, is the cerebellar function or the balance center of the brain. So what I do is I'm checking sensation when I do this too. And I say, sir, when I touch this finger here, I want you to take this finger with your eyes closed and touch your nose and then put your hand back to where it was. Okay, and put it back to where it was and make it even. Now do this finger that I'm touching there. And notice I touched a different finger on that side, so don't just assume it's the index finger and put it back out. Okay, now you can put your arms back down. I'll explain. So what I've tested here with his eyes closed is a number of things. Number one, I know that he can feel both sides because he used the finger that I touched. Number two, I'm checking his, uh, his coordination that he can touch his nose with both hands. Now, it doesn't matter if he goes up here or goes up here um, if they're the same. So if he's, got one, if, if he's just got bad balance and he misses his nose both times, that's a negative. But if he's got one that's up here and one that's right on the nose, that's a positive. That means you've got a cerebellar stroke going on. And also, if you can't tell you where, you where you're touching, that's a positive also for a sensory stroke. 
The other thing we're noticing here is I'm having him with his eyes closed make his hands level again. Because if he goes to put his hands out and one's like this and one's like this and he can't get them level, that's a sign of a stroke also. It's a sign of what we call proprioception stroke, where they, he can't judge where his, where his limbs are in space. So that's the first step. The next thing we're going to do is, again, with the Cincinnati stroke sale, is you're going to have him repeat a sentence. Now, there's nothing magic about that line, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You don't have to use that. The purpose of this, uh, this test is it tests his hearing, that he can hear you, that he understands what you're saying, that he can formulate in his brain what he wants to say, and then the speech comes out in clear speech pattern. That's what we're looking for. So it's testing multiple areas of the brain all at once. So I'm just going to have him count to 10 for me. Count to 10 for me. One, two, three. And that's good enough. So he understood what I wanted him to do. So he obviously heard. He understood it. He was able to produce a speech in his brain. He was able to speak the, the, uh, the sentence clearly. So it wasn't slurred speech, et cetera. So any malfunction in that would be positive. So whether it's the speech is slurred, he doesn't understand you, he doesn't repeat what you want him to repeat, all of those are positive, are positive for stroke. Now, the last thing we're going to look for, is for uh, as far as Cincinnati goes is facial asymmetry. So what I'm going to have you do is make a big smile, make a big grin. Now, again, what we're looking for is difference from one side and the other. Now, sometimes with, with minor strokes, what you'll see here is a difference between the nasolabial folds. And uh, again, think about... Um, using Botox. When you give Botox, the way it gets rid of wrinkles is it paralyzes the muscle. So what we're looking for when we look at facial asymmetry is one side that looks like it got Botox and one side that didn't look like it got Botox. So even if they're able to move the face on both sides, because sometimes it can be subtle if it's just mild weakness, what you'll see is that the nasolabial fold will be sort of uh, really deep on one side and not so deep on the other as if they got a Botox treatment and that would be positive. Now back to what we were talking about with Bell's palsy, just to show you the difference. I'm going to have you raise your eyebrows up really high. Now he can raise eyebrows up really high. So if he had one side of his face where it wasn't moving, yet he was able to do that, that means it's not the facial nerve. Facial nerve damage would be Bell's palsy. What we would see in Bell's palsy is one would go up and one would, and, uh, one would not go up. So Bell's palsy is a mimicker of stroke. If both eyebrows go up and yet he's got facial droop, that's a bad sign. If, if he's got a facial droop and and one eyebrow does not go up when you have them do that, that's probably Bell's palsy, particularly in a young po person. All right, so now continue with the neurological exam. So we've, we've done all the Cincinnati stroke scale, and we've done a couple of extra things. The next thing we're going to check is his visual fields, because that's another thing Cincinnati stroke does not get, is if you had an isolated stroke to the vision center of the brain. So what you do here is you have the patient cover one eye. So let me have you cover one eye. You have them look directly at your nose. So look directly at my nose here, sir. And you put your hands out where you can see it in your own peripheral vision. And, you sh and what you tell the patient is, tell me when you see the fingers shake and which sides are shaking. So which side's shaking? The left side. How about now? Now the right side. How about now? Both. Okay, so now he, it tells me that he can see both sides. Now, again, we're, and you would repeat the process for the other eye. You're looking for differences. So if he only sees it move on one side, it means he doesn't see this side. It means he's got a, a visual, what we call a visual field deficit, and that's a vision stroke, and that's, uh, that's also positive for a stroke. All right, and the last step of the, of the neurological exam is to do uh, a leg drift. It's basically the same thing you do with the arms, but it's only for the legs. And that's because the anterior cerebral artery uh, supplies uh, the middle part of the, of the brain and the front of the brain, and if you had a stroke in that part of the, in that circulation, the only effect you would see is a weak leg. You wouldn't see anything else, nothing else that I showed you so far. So what you do here is you go to the patient, you take their leg and you lift it up, you know, it's just a little bit off the bed like that, and you tell them, hold your leg in that position, and you count to five, one, two, three, four, five, and then you let them put it back down. And you repeat the process on the other side, and you can put it back down again. And again, what you're looking for is asymmetry. Some of our patients, they're weak especially some of our older folks, and they can't keep their, their leg off the bed. If they can't keep either leg off the bed, well, that's, that's, a, negative, that's a negative finding. That's not a stroke. They just have, they have weak legs. And, and you, you may see that uh, other scenarios where somebody had hip surgery, for example, and they're, they're weak on that side all the time. So we're not looking for old findings, and we, we don't care if they're weak both sides. We really are looking for a difference between one side and the other. That's what tells us that there's been a stroke. All right, so now that I've explained it, I'm just going to go through the stroke exam myself without stopping to explain it, just to show you it's, it's a relatively quick thing to do, and I'll just go do it as if I were evaluating the, the uh, stroke patient. All right, so let me have you lift your, your, your arms up, palms out. Great. Close, close your eyes for me. Touch your nose with the finger I'm touching. Good. Now put your hand back where it was and make them even. Now touch it with that side for me. Good. 
and put it back even. Good. And you put your arm, you can put your arms down. Make a big, big smile for me. Big grin. Good. Cover, cover your left eye for me, please. Look at my nose and tell me which finger's wiggling. The left side. How about now? The right side. How about now? Both. Switch eyes for me, please. Which side's wiggling? Both. Very good. Now you told me that both sides, both sides are wiggling, which is great. Count to 10 for me, please. One, two, three, four. That's good enough. Very good. Now I'm going to hold your leg up here. I want you to hold it for me for a count of five. Go ahead and hold it there for me. One, two, three, four, five. Good. Let's switch legs for me. Hold that one up for me. One, two, three, four, five. That's good. And we're done. That's how long it takes. So any asymmetry between those two sides and we'd be worried about a stroke. Uh, poor responses on both sides is, is a non-finding. That just means that if they're equally bad both sides, that's not a stroke. <music>